Hi, I'm Shane Croucher of IB Times UK and I'm delighted to be joined today by Christopher M. Schroeder, a US-based entrepreneur and author of a new book called Startup Rising, which says it documents the entrepreneurial revolution remaking the Middle East. So, hi Christopher, thanks very much for coming in today. We Great appreciate you coming in. Um, you. So first, just give me an overview of what your book Startup Rising is about and what you're hoping to achieve with it. Yeah, Startup Rising is a book that's about as counter-narrative at one level, particularly if you come from the West and the United States, because it's about tech and startups in the Arab world and in the Middle East. And usually in the West, there's one narrative about the Middle East, and it's about political instability, and it's about the unrest that we all know about. But in point of fact, what is happening there is happening everywhere in the world, which is an entire generation has access to technology. They're able to see the way the rest of the world is working. They won't have their political voice. They won't have their societal voice. It should be no surprise that they want an economic voice as well and are building these amazing startups all throughout the region. As you point out, the Arab Spring has opened up a world of opportunity um, for the people living in that world. Um, and one big part of that is business. Um, but there are still significant challenges going on in places like Syria and Libya. There's a lot of unresolved conflict. So how optimistic are you that the progress that they have made so far um, will continue and is not going to be derailed by what's going on around them? There's no question of what's happening in Egypt and Syria and elsewhere is in certain cases tragic. In fact, and it touches every aspect. I know entrepreneurs who I got to know and whose companies that I like who've either had to leave the country or in a couple of cases have actually been killed. This is a very difficult world that we have. But I think that there are two narratives going on anywhere. All emerging markets now, I think, are struggling between sort of a top-down view of the 20th century and a 21st century view of what can happen bottom up. And emerging markets are not for the faint of heart. There are going to be challenges, whether you're talking about India now, China for that matter, let alone other places. But something else is happening in parallel with that as well. We in the West tend to lump regions as one thing. Damascus is a terrible tragedy and a missed opportunity because there's so many wonderful, talented people there. But what's happening in Dubai, Amman, and elsewhere is very encouraging about what could also spread around the region. Um, tell us a bit about who you met in Damascus. Uh, and, and you know, like you say, it's a real tragedy that, that that's going on. But tell us a bit about who, who you met and what they were doing. So the great definition of entrepreneurship generally is people who can work around things. And so needless to say, you, in a place like Damascus, even then, back when politicians were calling Assad the great reformer, um, you couldn't really get access to Facebook. It was mobile access was very hard to do. And yet when I spent time in Damascus and I met these amazing young people, they all had their Facebook accounts open. They were all uh, connecting in very, very powerful ways. There's an amazing artistic sense in Syria. And so it was no surprise to me that I would see companies like computer animation or other kinds of areas where you mixed very good programming and ideas with a very kind of almost beautiful aesthetic sense and the usability and utility they built uh, for mobile uh, applications as well as for internet, generally speaking. Something I found particularly interesting in your book was the cultural challenges around getting investors in both worlds, the Middle East and the West, uh, to put their money into startups in the Middle East. So firstly, let's deal with the West, because in the West, particularly the US, there's, and this might be quite a strong word, but there seems to be cynicism uh, around doing business in the Middle East because of perceptions of political instability, um, corruption, and so on. So how do you overcome that sort of perception uh, among Western investors to put their money into Middle Eastern innovators? You know, I went to the region many times to interview literally hundreds of entrepreneurs and investors. But in some respects, the most interesting interviews I did with Silicon Valley, because the cynicism is not about the Middle East only but it's almost a backward-looking view of emerging markets. So to a person, people would tell me, venture capitalists and so on, we are very interested in emerging markets. We know the world is changing. But we'll go there if the market cap is big enough, meaning me, me, me. I get my opportunity there. Or we'll go there if I can outsource cheaply. Me, me, me. We'll go over there. And by the way, if there's any innovation in any of those places, they're going to want to come to Silicon Valley anyhow. And I think the big question that they're wrestling everywhere where there is political risk, because by definition emerging markets are political risk, is to think about innovation happening there bottom up and at large, large markets with rising middle classes and how are they going to engage with innovation that wants to stay put. And so this is a question that they're wrestling really everywhere. The Middle East with the political instability and the one narrative obviously compounds this somewhat, and yet people are beginning to come over there. So for example, one of the great incubators in Silicon Valley is called 500 Startups. And they're actually taking a whole trip of venture capitalists and entrepreneurs to the Arab world this November. So I think people are beginning to understand that they have to think about the next 10 years in a different way than they thought about the past. 
now on the other side of the fence, the Middle Eastern investors, there's a, a great quote from a young Egyptian investment banker that you've met uh, who sums up the culture of investors in the Middle East. And he says, it's deeply rooted in our culture to want to invest conservatively and in hard assets, yeah. things like property that feels real, that even in times of political uncertainty is something that one can touch and even live in. And he goes on to describe how failure is frowned upon and that it's a tangible measure of success to point to a building and say, I, I built that or I've in invested in that, rather than telling someone to go to a website that you've invested in. Um, so again, with this culture in mind, how do you overcome that? How do you change people's minds? To get into tech investments and startup investments is a bit of a, a portfolio mentality. There's an assumption that many of these will not work, but the ones that do work really have a multiplier ramification of it. And there's absolutely no question that there has been traditionally a very conservative view and, and not a cultural adoption of acceptance of failure. You know, there's a myth in Silicon Valley that we all love failure, which is, of course, nonsense as well. But there is a tolerance to understand that the first one might not work and the second one might. And I can only tell you two things. One, with a certain newer generation of investors, they're becoming much more tolerant of this. And it's actually manifests itself with a very large increase in angel investing throughout the Arab world now, which is encouraging. I think the next challenge is what we in the West call the A round, which is once you've gotten to a certain point, then you need a next million or two million. That's when I think we're going to have to see more change, because now for the first time, funds are being raised for the A round in the Arab world. But as an extension of the psychology that you described, it's been going slowly. And what I really think in the end is success breeds success. A couple of exits will happen, and I think that will actually encourage the phenomenon that you rightly described. There was another part of your book that particularly caught my eye, and this perhaps feeds into the culture question as well, because um, there was a person who posits the idea that libertarian economics um, and the principles of Islam perhaps have more in common than people realise. So both have a focus on individual responsibility and accountability, property rights, the promotion of free trade. So how far would you go along with that theory that perhaps there's a closer marriage than people think? One of the most moving experiences I had in the interviews and one of the most maybe controversial chapters that I wrote about was religion in the ecosystem. And it was controversial because I'm no expert in religion and, and I didn't want to open up that conversation. And yet I found every time I came back to the West, people would always ask me all the time about that. Interestingly, they ask me when I come back from the Arab world, they don't ask me when I come back from Indonesia, they don't ask me when I come back from Israel. So at one level I wanted to go at our own bias but I also thought it was a very interesting question to ask folks that if by a definition there's a governmental or other interpretation of one, religion that is hierarchical, top down, you have to follow it, and two, may put half of your talent, meaning women, on the side, will that be competitive in a global uh, venture world overall? And what was so moving about the interviews is they acknowledge that there is absolutely some of that there but they were incredibly passionate about faith as it's important to them and their motivations of doing good with the businesses they create, about their expression of individuality, about all sorts of kinds of things, which I believe is going to be very powerful on an ongoing basis. Again, the same way that technology has opened up amazing tech, uh, discussions in politics and business, people are having wonderful discussions about women in society, about religion in society, and I think it's a thing that we don't think about in the West, but is very powerful. And you would think that something like <clears throat> venture capitalism and investing in startup businesses marries perfectly with uh, Sharia compliance, which is obviously about shared risk and um, you know uh, you take part of the profits and part of the loss, and you know you're trying to do what is going to be a social good by building up a small business, creating jobs, things like that. And this commitment to the social good that this is something bigger than them. I mean, these are capital. I mean, these are people who want to make money; they wish to be successful. But general, I find this now generally in a lot of startups, even in the West, but it is something very apparent in the Arab startups, which is the line between what we would call entrepreneurship and social entrepreneurship is actually almost intertwined. Meaning at one level, yes, we're here to make money and we hope we're successful there. But the way we run our business, the problems we look to solve, will have huge ramifications in society more broadly, which is perfectly in line with their views of faith, spirituality, as well as their passion about uh, their countries and culture. Thanks again for joining us, Chris. Bruce. Thanks very much for having me. I'm Shane Croucher of IB Times UK, and thanks also to you for watching.